So last talk for today. Um, I won't smother you with too many slides, but Alexis will smother you with code later. Um, so this is a project we did with Alexis, Giovanni, and led by Bob um, in a collaboration with CQC, of course, under, under CQC. This is Bob's new logo. You will hear about it in the coming weeks, I guess. Um, and this project is about uh, creating a very easy to use interactive, well not interactive, but user-friendly Python library where you can um, create your own category theory. In our case, we specialize to composing these types that have to do with natural language that we heard about before in the previous talks. And then how, what I will show you is how we map these to circuits and come uh, a bit closer to realizing these things on a quantum computer. Um, so to start with, this is how this, this library is, is, is structured where um, we have boxes that compose, as Bob told us before. A box can have a name and a domain and a codomain. And domain and codomain is basically the inputs and outputs. So, box, domain, codomain. And then we can compose these things. We can put them side by side. They can have many in and out legs side by side these tensor products. And composition would be putting them one after the other. So this library does this. It allows you to do any composition you like. Um, it's correct by construction. So it respects all the axioms of category theory. So you don't need to wonder, to, to wonder if you ever did a bad composition that doesn't make sense. Everything you can write makes sense. Um, so then when you try to map it to particular architectures, you know that there is no problem. You don't have to check every time you try to map a structure to another structure. It's all categorical. Um, and what we aim to do is make this thing scalable for a particular architecture. And I'll talk about this later. Um, it also interfaces with, um, with other libraries that uh, have been um, advanced in CQC that uh, have under the hood PZ, uh, like um, the ZX calculus working with especially PZIX, which is used for simplifying diagrams and specifically Practically what it's used for is for um, simplifying quantum circuits so that you want uh, to reduce the depth or the width depending on the architecture so you can fit it in a particular architecture that has um, uh, connectivity constraints. For example, you might have a circuit that says, oh, I want this guy to communicate with this guy, but in your, so qubit one, qubit three, and in your actual architecture, you have, let's say IBM or or Getty or someone um, gives you some connectivity graph that says, yeah, we have an actual physical qubit, qubit one here, qubit two here, qubit three here, but qubit one, qubit two are not connecting. So you have to find the best um, realization of a circuit that would do this abstract circuit on an actual machine. So this is called, uh, this is called compiling. And um, Ticket is is the, the, the compiler that CQC is advancing, which with uh, uh, physics in the background. Um, we will also make some steps towards uh, realizing machine learning here um, in terms of quantum circuits that would be in, for, in the form of parameterized circuits, uh, but it's all the same thing. You just have a, a nonlinear thing that you can see as a black box with parameters. Try to optimize your parameters to do the thing you want to do. Um, all of this thing, all of this code is, is available at, uh, on GitHub, on this repo, and you can install, you can just pip install it and you can play with it. Uh, it's still, of course, uh, being developed. Um, but yeah, you can, you can play around. So, what is our dictionary? The goal, as I said, is um, to go from natural language to string, string diagrams. This we have heard a lot uh, in the previous talk, in the previous talks. So. A sentence type, which is either a noun or a verb or whatever, it is, um, ah, sorry, the grammatical types are mapped to, to diagrams. And here we have the particular dictionary of what gets mapped to what. So a sentence type would uh, map to a scalar, which is the empty diagram. Um, 
So scalar would be in the quantum in the quantum circuit language, and in diagrams it's just you draw nothing. A noun would be a wire, as you've seen everything being drawn. Um, a wire gets maps uh, gets mapped to a qubit. So every every one of these wires would be a qubit word line, like the standard circuit language, um, and so so on and so forth. For every type, we have a particular dictionary from from natural language types to string diagrams. To, to 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 circuits. So this is basically the high level overview of what's going on. G would be a category of pre-group types. Like we saw before, we have um, different grammatical types and they compose, they reduce to give you a sentence type. When this reduction is, is possible, this is a proof that a given um, a given parsing of a sentence reduces to a, the sentence type and it's a proof that it's a grammatical sentence. Um, so the whole disco model that we have heard about is this this arrow right there. So you go from from this G uh, grammar category to mat C. So that would be matrices, linear maps, um, in in the way that we have heard before. Um, however, we factor through, or basically we go through, we go through. Qubits. I have there a category called qubit of theta. It's parameterized circuits. Um, so we call this quantum disco uh, because we don't go directly to matrices using some co-occurrence vectors that we try to put into tensors. We go to parameterized circuits. And then, since you want to fill the boxes with numbers so that you evaluate your meanings or basically do semantics, what you have to do is try to find the appropriate um, compilation, let's say, of these boxes into gates. So that would be, if you if you have a quantum computer, you have to find the particular thetas that tune the gates so that your, um, I don't know, the, the corpus is is respected. Um, if you go just back to matrices, it's just matrices that simulate quantum circuits that do disco that do disco cut, or in other words, you're doing disco cut but only using unitary matrices, let's say. So this is the high level overview. And this is a very, very, very baby toy example that you've seen before. So for example, a very, very simple sentence would be Alice loves Bob. So I have two nouns connected, connected with a transitive verb. So I have a three-legged tensor. I have Alice and Bob who are noun types. Um, as Bob showed us before and Martha and Dimitris, these, the noun type, with uh, with a, a right inverse would cancel. So this, this is basically a proof that these things annihilate. So also here, and then the sentence type remains. So this is a grammatical sentence, and so on. Um, this gets mapped to this circuit. OK, so I put the triangles back so you see what's going on. We have mapped Alice to the zero state. We have mapped Bob to the one state. And then we have a unitary here, which has a C naught in there for, for, for to create entanglement. A C naught, yeah, and a unitary that encodes love. So these these other two cups here would would be um, basically bell state post selection, and the sentence wire which was hanging here is mapped to a scalar, which is essentially going to be the probability is that you post select on on this. The probability that you measure 0, 0, 0, 0001 after the circuit is realized. So that is that is the semantics that's going to be the semantics of this sentence. Um, so essentially what's going on is this. I've if you if you follow the colors, these cups and cups that are in, in blue have become bell state preparation and bell state post selection and Alice and Loves and Bob are states and unitaries. Here I have just unbent the wires. Instead of doing the bell state, I've just unbent the wires to make everything in one line. So you see that this is basically Alice Loves Bob in, in one line. And this is basically also what's, uh, what's in Will Zeng's algorithm with Bob, where they can bend the wires around to make, to make the circuits look however they want them to look so that they fit them in a particular architecture. So if you did this on a laptop, for example, you want it to look like this, because it doesn't take too much space. Um, so depends how you, what you want to do. But this is, this is canonical. Every diagram you give us, 
which looks like this, boom, it gets mapped to a circuit, and then it's, it's your problem to unbend it however you want to do, however you want to bend it to fit in an architecture, or you can just send this to PyTicket, and physics will do its magic and minimize the circuit, and, and that's it. So these are more complicated examples, so you don't only think we do Alice Loves Bob every time. So here is an example where we use a relative pronoun, where who is replaced by a, a spider tensor, or a GHZ tensor, or a copy tensor, um, which is basically, so who is basically going to be a three-legged thing, and the elements of this tensor is they are, so if we call it a delta, because it's like a delta function, it's going to be leg one, leg two, leg three. And the elements of the tensor are one, where all the legs are the same, leg two equals leg three. So the same index, and zero otherwise. So this basically what it does, is it, it, it copies, right? So Dimitri mentioned something like that. So whenever uh, whenever you requ uh, require copy operations, you can use this tensor to do, to do the job. So this tensor in a circuit form, it's realized by this, what is included in this box. So it's, it's two C nodes followed, uh, one after the other, and then the rest is as before. The cups and cups are bell states, preparation and post-selection, and Verbs are uh, a C node for entangling and one phase for unity. So here all the lines are mapped to qubits. So you see it's very small scale, but you can imagine that you scale, scale this up. So for example, a wire instead of one qubit, it could, it could have many qubits, as much as you want to encode your meanings. And correspondingly here we have the sentence wire to be the scalar, so it's the evaluation of the circuit after the bond rule, but you could imagine that you put also qubits there if you, if you want more space for your meaning space to do more complicated tasks. But for now, this is a proof of concept. So these are references where you can find the background material for all of this. And our contribution, um, our main contribution for this is building the, the Python library that allows you to very easily manipulate and construct all of these circuits without any, any prior preference to, to dimensions or anything like that. You can have these as parameters and add them later. So it naturally creates any circuit you like that then you can send to, to interfaces like PyTicket or other compilers. And I guess now it's demo time for Alex to show you how exactly this works. Hello, cool. So yeah, as Bob said, demos never work, so maybe I should Start with just the, the GitHub page where you can find the notebooks. Um, so it's at Oxford Quantum Group slash DiscoPy. You can have a look at the notebooks. The code is um, compiled already. So in case it doesn't work, you can always go to the backup. And you can run it yourself. Uh, and it's just pip install DiscoPy. And in one click, you you're done. So let's go to the demo. So is that big enough? Yeah, I guess it will have to do. So the idea is we've implemented, so as Constantinos was saying, we've implemented essentially three monoidal categories. So essentially categories of diagrams. So how it works in practice is you import some, the pregroup type and the word boxes from DiscoPy. Now you can create your atomic types, your basic types. So in our toy experiment, we're going to use just sentence and noun. Uh, in general, you'd probably want more than that. And you can create a bunch of boxes. So here, the boxes are words. So it's assumed that they are just triangles. They don't have any input. And they are given a type. So for example, Alice has the type noun. And Bob also has the type noun. And I can create complicated types, like the, send the transitive verb type that we've seen a few times by now, so I take uh, the adjoint of the noun, I tensor it with sentence, and the adjoint of the noun to the other side. And so let's run it and see what happens. Should take a bit of time to load the library and then print us um, our vocabulary. So I get a warning because uh, we're not using GPU, so today, these days, it's a warning if you're only 
doing stuff on your MacBook. But um, the, the idea is you can deploy this algorithm very easily to GPU. It's kind of GPU native. Um, and OK, so now that we have a bunch of boxes, a bunch of worlds, we need to create some grammar. So how do you create a grammar? Well, you need diagrams, right? So you can import diagrams. And well, diagrams are going to be made of wires and cups. So we want to implement this Alice Loves Bob picture that Constantino showed you. So we'll create a diagram for the, the grammar. So it's a cup followed by a wire, followed by another cup, side by side, I mean. And now we're going to create um, a little Python dictionary, which is going to send so strings of words, so just uh, strings, Python strings, to diagrams. So in this particular case, the grammar is fixed. It's always the same, because we are only doing subject, verb, object sentences. And so I'm going to build all of the sentences with Alice and Bob as nouns and love as a verb. So now if I try to print um, one of the diagrams, so let's pick Alice loves Bob as our favorite example, I get this uh, complicated expression here, which tells me that how to build Alice loves Bob is first I do Alice, then I have a wire noun for what was the output of Alice, and I do Bob, uh, I do loves, then I have a more complicated wire and I do Bob, and then I do my two cups. So essentially the way it's stored under the hood is you have a diagram is made of a domain type. So here is the empty type uh, and a codomain, which is sentence in this case. Then you give me a list of boxes, and you give me a list of offsets. So the offsets tell me where to put the box in the diagram. And that's it. So that's why you get, instead of Alice, Tensor Love, Tensor Bob, you get one line for each is essentially it's a funny monoidal category. So you have to do the interchanger by hand if uh, that speaks to some of you. So if I print the list of grammatical sentences, I get Alice loves Alice, Alice loves Bob, Bob loves Alice, and Bob loves Bob. So that's our small language. And now, well, sentences are diagrams, and well, circuits are diagrams as well. So we can import the circuit module from Descopy. We can import some gates. So here we'll need uh, the identity gate and the X rotation and the control knot. And we can build our little diagram. So here I'll just do a rotation on X on the left qubit, then identity on two qubits, then a, a C knot and a rotation, some random circuits. So that's what it looks like in Descopy. So I try to import ticket and let it load, and that's what it looks like in PyTicket. So uh, you can go back and forth. So if you have your PyTicket circuit, you can also turn it back into a diagram. And in this case, the diagrams are not exactly equal because of this interchanger that I told you. So if you have a tensor like this or a tensor like that, they should be equal in terms of categories, but uh, we treat them as different. But you can always do the interchanger, um, the interchanger explicitly. So my, C, my circuit C0 is actually equal to C1. So now let's, we can use predefined gates, but we can also create our own gates. So we'll create this H gate, uh, which is a one qubit gate. And we need to tell uh, Descopy what the array for this one qubit gate is. And I'll make it the Hadamard 111 uh, minus uh, one. And you notice that it's not a normalized gate in a sense that it's this one is only a unitary, is a unitary only up to a number. So there's a missing square root two in this. But I guess as long as we're doing diagrams, we don't really care about normalization just yet. So it's fine to have gates that are not actually quantum gates. But from this, I'll create a small uh, function which takes a phase and builds me a small ansatz for the verb. So let's see what this looks like. We've got a matrix. So matrix is another class of DiscoPy. Uh, essentially, it's NumPy matrices with extra uh, bureaucracy on top to keep track of domain and codomain. So um, I have this matrix, and it's indeed the Bell state. Well, almost the Bell state, because there's this missing square root 2 factor. But it's indeed the matrix 1, 0, 0, 1, as we as we would want. So I guess this intuition that like the Bell state is just an identity wire bent around, uh, you can see it here, you have the identity matrix. So we can 
composed diagrams, we can also take the dagger of diagrams, and that's how we implement, uh, let's say, similarity in our model. Uh, I guess here it would tell you what the uh, inner product of the two states would be. So in this case, I do the verb ansatz for zero, for zero, five, and I get almost zero as an inner product. They're almost orthogonal, or up to 10 to the minus 15. Now, if instead I do my verb ansatz with itself, and I take that dagger, the inner product is indeed one. Well, up to, uh, up to a normalization factor because of what I've just uh, told you about the edge gate. So what's the point of this? Now we have grammar implemented as, in terms of diagrams, and we have circuits implemented in terms of diagrams. And they are indeed the same picture. What does it mean is we can build a functor from our grammar to quantum circuits. So what does this, this functor look like? I can import this circuit model class from this copy. I give it an image on objects. So in our toy example, we're just saying sentences are scalars, so zero qubit. And nouns are qubits, so one qubit. And now I need to give it an image on arrows. And here, for our toy example, we'll decide that Alice is ket zero and Bob is ket one. So they are indeed orthogonal to each other. They're not the same person. And we'll decide that the um, image of loves will be given by this verb ansatz that we've just created above. So now we can construct uh, functors by just giving their image on objects and their image on arrows. And here we have parameterized functors in a sense that for each parameter that you can give me, I have such a functor. So let's pick some dummy parameters. Let's pick 0, 5 so that we actually have like uh, an X gate, a NOT gate. And let's look at what circuit we get for Alice loves Bob. We get this kind of complicated thing where we prepare a cat with uh, cat zero on one qubit, then we prepare two cats, cat zero, zero, two qubits, so we have three qubit, a uh, three qubit circuit, then we do an H gate, a rotation on X, a controlled X, then another cat for Bob, and then we do the rest of the circuit. So this one, we can't translate it to pi ticket just yet because of the cats and bras that are not actual, actually part of the circuit formalism, but we get a closed circuit, so with preparation and post-selection. So now what can we do with this circuit? We can evaluate it. So let's see what this circuit looks like once we evaluate it. It's a matrix and it's one to one. So it's just a scalar. And what is this scalar? It's uh, the number one plus some um, uh, epsilon times i. So it's a complex number. It's the amplitude for Alice Loves Bob. And under the hood, what does this eval do? It's another functor, essentially. Is just the evaluation functor, which goes from the category of qubit and linear maps to the category of matrices and linear maps. So we evaluate, we get an amplitude, and we can also measure, which basically means evaluate and then do the Born rule. And what do we get? Well, if we get something close to one, it means Alice really loves Bob. If it's close to zero, it means she doesn't. So let's check. She does. She does love Bob, and I guess here it's a toy example. We've just taken X, uh, we've just taken love to be the not gate. So essentially, uh, cat zero loves cat one, and cat one loves cat zero. But let's uh, build a corpus. So for each sentence, now we want to evaluate our functor. So let's evaluate f params for each sentence, and then print which sentences are true and which sentences are false. We get the not gate. So Alice loves Bob, Bob loves Alice. They don't love themselves. So now, the point is we're going to use this toy corpus for sentences as the truth, and we're going to try and learn these sentences, uh, learn their meaning, um, starting from some other random parameters. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to do basically vanilla gradient descent, and so we're doing gradient descent over circuit functors from grammar. And Essentially, this wouldn't have been possible if we didn't have a magical library from some Google guys, which allows us to take gradients of arbitrary Python NumPy functions. So it's called Jax. We import Jax, and essentially we replace NumPy by Jax.NumPy, and we're done. So let's build a complicated function, f. It's a lambda. It takes a phase, and then it has the mean squared loss of evaluating f of param 0 on the sentence, and f of this phase on the same sentence, we take the mean squared loss. 
So kind of a complicated Python function, and well, Jax just differentiates it. So we do gradient of f, we get a new function, we apply it to a particular value, we get the scalar. And here the scalar happens to be pi, but uh, yeah. So we also get a warning because we did the born rule. So we turned the complex number into a real number, and Jax uh, warns us it's kind of a dodgy thing to do, but I guess that's what quantum mechanics uh, tells us to do. So not only can we like, take the gradients of function, we can also vectorize them. What does this mean is we can apply the same function f to here 100 inputs um, as a matrix multiplication instead of doing it one by one. So here we'll just compute the value of f on everything from 0 to 1 and compute its gradient uh, on every value from 0 to 1. And let's just plot this and see what it looks like. A little bit of plotting. OK, so here's our first picture. We've got a, we call it a functorial landscape because essentially we have a parameter, so the, this x, um, this, um, x um, axis. And for each value of this parameter, we have a functor. We apply this functor to every sentence. We get a testing loss compared to what the truth value uh, were. And here, obviously, we can see that when we get close to 0, 5, we're close to the truth. So we can also compute the gradient, and we, we see, indeed, the, the two of them are, like, uh, are going to be um, periodic functions because of all the, the, the nice symmetries we have with our phase rotations. And so now that we have a gradient and we have a landscape, we can do gradient descent. So let's do a little machine learning experiment. We split our corpus into testing and training set. And so we're going to train on three sentences, Bob loves Bob, Alice loves Alice, Bob loves Alice. We're going to test on the last one, uh, which we interpret as a question. So does Alice love Bob? If our machine learning algorithm got the first three all right and trained on these three sentences, it should, it should guess what the answer to this last question is. So let's import the last piece of magic from Jax, which is uh, JIT, so just-in-time compilation means that now we can take any Python function, and not only can we differentiate it, uh, we can vectorize it, but we can also compile it. So it means here I'm going to run these two functions, testing loss and update. I'm going to run them the first time. It's going to take a few seconds. And then I'll run them a thousand times, and it's going to take no time. So we've got the loss for each sentence. is a small dictionary. Then our testing loss is um, the mean of this loss for each sentence in the testing set. And now we have this update function, which essentially just takes your parameters, and then for each parameter, for each word, we're just going to remove the gradient from it times some step size, which is a hyperparameter. So yeah, the simplest kind of gradient descent you can imagine, we just do params equals params minus step size times gradient. So let's compile. It takes a bit of time. So two seconds to compile an update. I guess here we, we only have three sentences to, to evaluate, so it's a bit of a small example. And now we're going to try some new random parameters and try and learn what this does. So let's run this guy. So our random parameter was 0 0.02, so far away from a half. And we have a testing loss to start with, which is close to 1. Now. The first epoch, so running this update, took two seconds, close to two seconds again, but then it gets close to, so yeah, here I guess I should say that for every epoch, I'm running the update 10 times. So here, it, what it means is that it took, uh, it, it took about a tenth of a second to run the first epoch, to run each update. Now, we run it uh, six times uh, more, time, yeah, 60 times more, and now it takes almost no time. So every update now took a tenth of a millisecond. And we do a bit of gradient descent. We get to the bottom of our landscape. And we're done. We got 0 0.475, which is not too bad. So let's try and see if we've actually learned anything. Does Alice love Bob? She does. So I guess that would be the, the smallest non-trivial example. So we've got three sentences we train on. One sentence we test on, and it works. I guess with one parameter landscape, it's the easiest thing you could do. So let's try and do a little bit more complicated. 
And okay, so we'll take the relative pronoun example this time, and we have a bit more of a, a bit more complicated vocabulary. So let's launch this guy again the same morning, no GPU. So this time I don't want to draw the grammar and the diagrams for each of the sentences I'm going to do, so I'll just do some brute force search through all the grammatical sentences. So it shouldn't take all that much time, but I guess it's the least efficient thing that you could do. So brute force, and we get 20 sentences that are grammatical. It takes about five seconds, doesn't scale all that well because it's brute force, but okay. So all, our language is going to be made of these grammatical sentences. Alice is rich, Bob is rich, Alice loves Alice, all the way up to Alice who loves Bob loves Bob. Um, so these are like the 21st grammatical sentences that showed up. So let's have a look at one of the diagrams for them. So a bit more complicated than before. So what's the diagram for Alice who loves Bob is rich? We have Alice who loves Bob is rich. Okay, so a bunch of states and then a bunch of cups. So cup, 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 and a bunch of wires. So it looks ugly right now, but I guess this data is enough to define the diagram formally. And then eventually we'll write a proper print function so we can actually see what, ha what happens. Um, so, okay. So as Konstantinos was saying, we're going to interpret the relative pronoun with a GHZ state. So let's build a small circuit that actually does the GHZ. And again, this annoying square root two here is because we don't want the GHZ normalized state, we want a non-normalized version of it. So let's evaluate this GHZ state. We indeed get, well, close to it, we get essentially 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 1, 1, which is what we'd expect. So this is the, let's say, mathematical uh, Frobenius algebra, and I guess if you divide this guy by square root 2, you get the GHZ state. So here we're all in simulator, we don't need to normalize anything. So let's um, import some NumPy and let's do, um, yeah, let's build a new functor. So now we're gonna have two kinds of ansatz. The first one is intransitive. So for the verb uh, is rich, for the phrase is rich. And an in intransitive verb is just uh, a rotation, uh, an X rotation after a cat. And now we keep the same uh, ansatz for the transitive verb loves. So a bell state followed by uh, an X rotation, with an X rotation. So what does our functor look like? Again, the same parameters on objects. So sentences are scalars and nouns are qubits. And now, okay, I have two parameters, one for loves and one for is rich. And I have this GHZ state for the who. And that's enough to define my functor, so now I can, I can apply it to any grammatical sentence. Uh, given this vocabulary. So we have again this parameterized uh, functor, so it takes some parameters and it gives you a circuit model. And again, we'll start with some easy parameters to interpret, so we'll take 0, 05 for is rich, and well, 0, 05 for loves, and 1 for is rich. And let's see what the circuit looks like. So We've got a kind of a complicated circuit. It looks more complicated than it needs to because we only write one gate per line. But I guess we could hope for PyTicket to do the magic here. Um, so we've got, yeah, this complicated circuit, uh, which is closed in a sense. It starts with a bunch of preparation and it ends with post selection. So again, we're going to evaluate our sentences on every grammatical sentence we have, uh, evaluate our functor on every grammatical sentence. And it's true if it's close to one, it's false if it's close to zero. So let's run this. It takes a bit of time evaluating the functor on each sentence, and it should give us a bunch of true sentences very soon. It's kind of long to apply a functor, you know, you need a lot of bureaucracy, the diagrams, the, the tensor products, all of this, but we get through it, and we've got these true sentences, so Alice is rich and she loves Bob, and Alice, who is rich, love Bob. So we get this compositionality idea of um, this is indeed what we uh, expect for the, for the relative pronoun. And then a bunch of false sentences. So let's split them in train and test uh, again. So it just shuffled the thing and split it in two. So we've got a bunch of training sentences, a bunch of testing sentences. And they look very repetitive indeed because we only have five words in our vocabulary. 
Uh, but I guess here the, the point is more proof of concept of this algorithm indeed captures the compositional structure of your grammar. So a bunch of training testing sentences and then we do the JAX magic again. We're gonna compile a training loss and a testing loss. Takes a bit of time, it needs to apply the functor again on every input given some parameters. So it takes a bit of time and here we're applying the, the loss on the original parameters so we get zero, which makes sense. 13 seconds to compile just the loss. So applying it the first time took 13 seconds. Let's do the same for the update. So again, we'll do a vanilla gradient descent. We just do params minus step size times the gradient. And we just in time compile, and here it should take a while because it computes the gradient of a functor into quantum circuits, and it does a lot of complicated bureaucracy. So it's gonna take a while. But I guess the point of this JIT is that once we've gone through the work of applying the function the first time, so here I just applied to the, param the initial parameters. Once we've gone through the patience of compiling it, uh, we can, oh, okay, so we've got it. So the params stay the same, which is what we'd expect because the gradient is gonna be zero. And it took 24 seconds to compile the update to apply it once, right? So here I apply it once, 24 seconds the first time. And I guess 24 seconds to compile an update if you want to do efficient gradient descent, it's not gonna, it's never gonna finish. But with this JIT thing, essentially, let's initialize some random parameters again. So we take some random parameters, and right now, Alice, who loves Bob, is not rich. Or she doesn't love Bob, we don't really know. But uh, so right now, our true sentence is not true yet with these random parameters. So this update function that took a good 30 seconds to, to compile the first time, let's run it uh, a thousand times and see what happens. And we're gonna see a nice speed up of now it takes uh, 300 microseconds. So we got a, a good time, 10,000 speed up. Um, so yeah, about 300 microseconds and that's the first update, the second update, the third, and then this guy is after uh, 333 updates. Uh, it took about um, one-tenth of a second. And again, 40 milliseconds to run 300 times, and 30, 58 milliseconds to run uh, another 300 times. So in the end, we get something very close to the truth in the sense that our loss went very close to zero. So let's check if Alice, who loves Bob, uh, is indeed rich, rich. So let's see, yes, she is. So we've actually learned. So let's go back and check that the Alice who loves Bob is rich was not in our training set. It wasn't, so we didn't assume that it was the case. We just learned it from these sentences and the compositional structure. We learned that indeed Alice who, is, uh, who loves Bob is rich. So, yeah, I guess that would be the, the smallest example of two parameters. So two parameters is nice because you can actually visualize it. So let's run uh, this VMAP means that we can uh, now apply our training loss to a uh, good, uh, I guess that would be a good um, 100, well, yeah, I guess 100 times 100, 10,000 examples. So let's run 10,000 examples at once and see what happens. It shouldn't take too long. And then we can print our landscape and see what, what kind of world our machine learning is trying to, to understand. And we get this beautiful 3D surface with, so we've got the parameter, the, the face for is rich, the face for loves, and then our loss is this complicated surface, uh, this 3D this surface in three dimensions. And now I guess the whole objective will be to scale this up to really high dimensional stuff. So, the, the, the kind of parameters that you can adjust will be making the noun space more than one qubit, making the sentence space more than a scalar, uh, having more than two parameters, and you get uh, not, toy, not so toy model of language. So that's all for the demo, and it actually worked, so I'm kind of happy. And yeah, last slide, I guess I can let Konstantinos uh, give the last few words. And yeah, right. thanks. Thanks. So yeah, the demo did work, that's good. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that was it. So what actually happened was, le let me summarize. So 
Alexis created a bunch of sentences, he mapped them to circuits, and then he didn't know what to put in the boxes, but they were evaluating to true or false. So then, if someone tells you these sentences are true and these are false, you can do machine learning to learn what you should put in the boxes so that what should be true is true and what should be false is false. If you partially know some of them, you can, you can use the compositional structure or the algorithm does it for you to infer those that you don't know based on, based on the ones that you know. So, yeah, um, the next immediate step would be to actually run this on, on, on some hardware, so some, some quantum computer. The overhead there is that when you want to update your parameters, um, because this is cloud-based, you have to go back in the queue. So let's say these thetas, these parameters, you tweak them a bit with the gradient that you have estimated um, with some shots on some, some um, superconducting computer. Let's say you do a thousand shots, you get some, some estimate for the loss function. Then some people are sending also jobs to the machine. So that, that is the overhead. You have to go back to the queue and wait until these jobs are finished and then you get to run your circuit to update the parameters. So this is gonna take um, a bit of time. It's not like milliseconds. There's like some overhead for waiting, but it's exactly the same. So and the circuits that Alexis showed you are very, very small, so they're totally feasible. So in, in one or two months, we're gonna have this running, having, have, having had run on a machine. Um, and then um, on the classical side, what I would really like to see, and we should totally do, is uh, a scaling analysis adding more qubits, growing the corpus, growing the sentences, uh, making the grammar more complicated, and we want to see how these variational circuits converge. So the convergence behavior is very important. Um, so, because then, then that gives you also an estimate of how long you have to wait on an actual machine. Um, what else do I need to say? Yeah, I have to disappoint uh, Chris Manning we have to run some benchmarks at some point, comparing with, <laughs> with, with what is known. And, and then we have to graduate at some point to running Grover to do the Zen cookie thing for closest vector to compare sentences, or, or maybe nouns to start with. But running Grover on a machine, maybe it's not so nisky, but maybe we, we can be smart about it at some point. We'll, we'll tell you, we'll tell you, coming soon. Uh, I, guess, I guess this is all the comments I wanted to make, yeah. Thank you. Pub. <laughs> so if the mic's working, it does sound like the mic's working. Okay. So obvious question, if you have the, the string diagram thing, why don't you simplify the diagram and generate the circuit from the simplified diagram? It'd be much smaller. At which level you have to do the snake removal? So the diagram simplification. So doing the diagram simplification, does it buy you anything? Or can you simplify anything optimally just at the low level using your compiler? So it, it really depends on the boundary conditions, I guess. If you, if you keep the legs open and if you can exchange inputs to outputs in a circuit, it should be equivalent. That's my intuition. If, if, you do, if you don't have this freedom with your compiler, then it's really worth it to do the diagram simplification at the high level and then compile down. Once you have your input output wires fixed and you can't exchange them with wire bending at the physics level, then you just have to simplify by reducing depth, I guess. More questions? To do like a thousand shots on the big machines, it was something like of the, of the order of seconds. Yeah, without the waiting. Yeah. If you if you don't have to queue if you don't if you don't have to queue and the only overhead is sending it running it and reading it back, it's some seconds for a thousand order of thousands of shots for some machines and then 
it depends how many updates you have to do. So then it depends on the landscape, and that's why I said we have to do some scaling analysis. Because when you add more parameters, the, land the landscape is going to be horrible. It's not like this easy periodic thing that Alexis had, where all the minima is basically the same minimum. I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be horrible. You're not going to go to the, mark, the absolute minimum, but a, a local one we have to, to do. That's how, that's how it is with machine learning. Um, why you have convergence? I guess this has to do with the universal approximator theorem. In our case, it's just too small. It goes quick because it's small. It's two, two parameters. It's an easy landscape, as I said. But in general, I mean, Christine also there would, would know that the stuff is, is horrible. Like, you, you have these barren plateaus, as they call them. All the, all the local minimum look, lo, minima look the same. I, this is a generic problem also in classical machine learning. It's not a quantum thing. It's about landscapes of nonlinear stuff. So we have two more eager-looking questions, so we'll take those two and then let you all go. Um, so I just want to cl clarify, how many iterations was it before it converged? And then also the second demonstration that you had, um, how many qubits was required for that encoding? The first was three, if I understood correctly. That's right. Um, what was it? So, so five, you said, Alexis? So in my, in my picture, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is, this is the most, this is eight by not optimizing anything. So it's still pretty small. And, then the iterations. and the iterations are like 10 or something like that. And then you have converged with crazy accuracy. So uh, three or four would do. Exactly. This, this is totally the stupid version. So this can be simplified. It doesn't have to be. So that, that's, that's, that relates to Ross's question. So you can simplify at a high level. That's a smart thing to do. Or you can... If, if, you, if your compiler can bend wires at the low level, so instead of fixing inputs and outputs and then simplifying, if you can also forget, you just have open legs, and then you have a tensor network to simplify. That, that's more freedom for you to, to simplify networks. So you don't have to do it at the high level. So you, it's, up, it's up to how it works internally, I guess. No, you don't, you don't lose accuracy or anything. It's just reshaping. It's exact. It's exact. I mean, the more, if you have more qubits, it's worse. You, you want to have as less as possible. And that the depth has to be as, as short as possible. This, yeah. is, this is just for me to show that this is, this is in principle possible to, to map any of these guys into a circuit. I'm not showing you the optimal circuit. I just have this picture because it's, it's the closest to that one so that you see... This arrow, basically. Just visualize this arrow, just to make a point. Last question. Oh, oh that was it. All right, OK, great. So, uh, uh, so let's uh, th you know, thank the speakers and, indeed, the uh, staff who've done such a wonderful job of hosting us here today. And see you tomorrow morning. Thank you.